So to recap the series so far, in Jisei, we met our uh, nameless protagonist, who wasn't more realistically just didn't want to offer up his name. He has his reasons. That's all we knew about it then. He gets caught up in a murder mystery case at the coffee shop he went to. Which turned out to be more than a simple murder mystery. There was uh, industrial espionage involved. A deal gone wrong, so to speak. Between the client who hired the industrial spy and... the industrial spy who was the murder victim. We also learned, uh, unintentionally learned, not... Okay, in... We did come away from the first game with the knowledge of there being a third party interested in the information. We didn't identify them. We only got that info when uh, we got a bad ending <laughs> and got killed by chance. Asking too many questions about the USB and what's on it. But Naoki was also in the coffee shop knew about this, knew about the third party to some degree. They don't know who. But, uh, Kangai's involvement in that case and the coincidental involvement of Aki and Naoki. Aki, who was sending Kangai thoughts from a, a distance. And Naoki, who was in the coffee shop, at the time. Were they working for, uh, Al for, uh, Alton? Pharmaceutical company. Who I believe the spy had stolen from. They were, lo they were lo looking to track down the spy and the info she took, which is why Naoki was there at the coffee shop at that particular date and time, localized entirely within this coffee shop. And so the knowledge of there being a third party interested in it, even though the third party was there the whole time, is what led into Kansei. The circumstances of that case led to Kangai uh, shacking up with the the uh, silly siblings and their pal Lime, another mysterious mysterious gal who is a uh, full-fledged empath who can read the emotions of the people around her to the point where she can struggles to distinguish them from her own which is something we learned when we got to know her in Kansei. So in Kansei, we go to William Auten's house, the Aki and Naoki's client, and the head of Auten Industries. I forget the exact company name, but it's Auten something or other. And we go to meet with him, but... He dies before we can actually meet with them and discuss the case in question. And now, in Kansei, we learn quite a lot of information. Let's see, we meet his we meet his nephew, who I'm blanking on his name, but his nephew won uh, was uh, getting into dogfighting. And was a bit of a rebel. It was about to be written out of his will. 
which made him a suspect, and two... wasn't really... an Auten by blood. Three kind of kind of resemble, kind of could pass for Khan guy to some degree, which is why Khan guy was mistaken for him at the start of things. Let's see. We also met. We also met Mar Marissa, the reporter who was looking to dig up some dirt on uh, William Alton's past misdeeds, uh, unethical experiments on uh, human test subjects. And whatnot. And in one path... We actually dig up some old documents on said uh, tests, which were supposedly buried way back when. Now, I don't remember the name of the man who Alton had partnered with, but one thing we do eventually learn down the time, down the line, is that one... Uh, Alton's nephew was actually his partner's son. And two, the thing that we learned in the stinger after getting the true ending is that chance from Jisei was actually Alton's nephew's brother. The daughter of the same. I might have that wrong, but I believe they were—they were definitely related, sibling-wise. And who, essentially, they were definitely related, but estranged. Chance recruited him to steal some documents from William Alton, his uncle. That was all he did in all this. So he's out. Now, the act, as far as who actually killed William Morton, well, since I got flack for not talking about it in Kansei, with regards to the culprit of Jisei, who realistically the culprit of Jisei doesn't matter. in terms of where the plot is going, so... In fact, I don't even rem <laughs> remember her name. Or the name of the company that she worked for. But in this case... You didn't watch Kansei. It's the IT guy. We found out an especially odd fact about William Alton is that these the employees that he keeps closest to himself. He doesn't pay them with money. He sort of gets them into situations that only he can help them out with, uh, like his personal assistant. Her husband was moved to the top of their uh, synthetic organ list in return for her services as personal assistant. Kevin, the IT guy, had student loan debt, but uh, where the predatory lenders uh, racked up the interest rates on him. After graduating, so... He took this job with William Alton because William Alton could keep the lenders off of his back till they could repay. As it turns out, Kevin, the IT guy, if you try, you, you don't you don't screw over an IT guy, because if you do what William Alton did, the IT guy's gonna find out.
The IT guys know their shit. I mean, come on. Kevin found out that, uh... William Orton, actually owned by proxy, several of the companies that held those loans, that bought up his student loans and had racked up the interest rates, so... By proxy, William Orton created the situation that looped Kevin into his indentured servitude. So Kevin had a very good motive to kill him. I'm discussing that because... Really... really William Orton is at the center of this... Seems to be at the center of this backstory. Of the core backstory of the series to some degree. Especially with Kangai. Where in another path... Both paths being canon. Where we... One, we discover the history of the experiments and the information about uh, Orton's old partner in said ex unethical experiments. And two, we discover the vault that William Orton wanted to protect in his last moments, and the SD card was inside, which had surveillance video of what looked like a young Kong guy. Which, if this is true, that explains why William Orton freaked the fuck out when Kong guy approached his office. So we have that tease ahead of us. We have the experiments that William Orton ran in the past. Other experiments potentially involving Kongai and his backstory. And his sister, who was killed, which prompted him to run away from home for several years. And Hell, even their backstory to begin with, they were very clearly brought up in some sort of experimental environment and were exceptionally sharp, intelligent, and uh, utilized their talents to solve cases to some degree. Until Kangai's sister was murdered and Kangai fled. And now, the group that Kangai and his sister worked with, supposedly, want them back. Wants him back. We have that at hand, too. We also have the fact that uh, Aki and Naoki once were a bunch of. Rampaging grifters before they turned themselves into the police and cop the deal to uh, essentially be police assets solving cases for them. And Lee May's past is still mysterious, but Lee May has a very aggressive side, as we saw in another ending path. So, a lot to recap about these the core cast. A very interesting core cast. They came a long way in the second game. And with that recap over, 14 minutes into the video, let us start Yos Yusei. The third investigation. Hey, how are you feeling? Okay, I guess. Still a little tired. Do you want to come downstairs and eat? Um... What's wrong? I don't think I can be around the others right now. Too... too loud for you? No. It's nothing. I know the tone of voice. It's not nothing. You can tell me. You'll think I'm crazy. Huh. I already know you're crazy. You think so? Whoa, this really is serious. What's wrong? This morning at breakfast, John lied when he said he did his homework already. Oh? What? And Lily said she came back before curfew, but she didn't. Hmm? Well, that was pretty obvious, but... No, you don't get it. It's been happening to me all day. Every time someone lies, my head starts throbbing. It's like a headache. 
Oh, is that your Kansei? Are you sure? Maybe your body is just projecting the transfu transfusion? I'm sure. It only starts hurting when someone lies. I told you you think I'm crazy. I don't think you're crazy. I think you're tired. I'm scared. I don't know why this is happening. Hey, it might not be anything. Maybe. I can stay here with you if you'd like. No, it's okay. I don't want oh. you to worry about me. Don't be silly. I'm your big brother. I'll always worry about you until the day you die. Oh, that's ominous. For a few frantic seconds, I slam my hand desperately against the snooze button on my alarm clock. When the ringing doesn't stop, I force open an eye. A slim phone is vibrating slowly across the end table. Whose phone is that? Oh, right. Mine. When did I get a phone? I reach out a hand just in time to catch it as it slips from the edge of the table, still ringing cheerfully. I clumsily tap the screen until the ringing finally stops. With a moan, I hold the phone to my ear. Uh, yeah. I meant to say hello, but I have words must have gotten lost somewhere in the journey between my brain and my mouth. Kangai! Good morning! Oh, hello! Marissa's stripper voice contains not a, even a single trace of irony. Uh? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I wake you? I, no, this is how I always answer the phone. I thought I thought a shirt said Nemesis there, but I think it says Mimetic. Oh, hey, a complete sentence. I guess sarcasm is a reflex. Well, I looked into what you asked me about. Eh? I asked her about something? Heavy recent events, trying to remember what we even spoke about. Let's see, last week was when I first got to Edgewater and tripped over that dead body in the coffee shop. Found the killer, but after that I fell in with Aki and her crew of, uh... Actually, I'm not sure what to call them. Government agents, according to Aki. Prisoners, according to their handler, Detective Gursky. Probably both. Uh, and that's when the real trouble started. We all wound up investigating the murder of William Ong, corporate CEO and a generally unlikable fellow. Marissa was a reporter trying to uncover some of his secret dealings at the time, and then... Kangai, did you hear me? Huh? Sorry, what? I was recapping. I said oh, I couldn't oh. find out much about that man you asked me about. Chingguan? Ah, that's the name of the partner? Of Alton's partner? Also, I just also just realized that uh, Kangai's shirt says Memento Mori, which is very fitting. Oh, right. Before he passed away, William Orton was involved in some sort of secret dealings with a business partner, partner Shen Guan. Shen seems to have disappeared completely, but it looks like he and William went to grad school together at the University of Edgewater. Oh, local boy. Their research project was shut down after it killed half of their test subjects. Oh. Well, that's ominous. You might want to talk to Dr. Johansson about him. Uh, who? He was in charge of their research project before it shut down. He's been traveling around the world lecturing, but he's scheduled to return to Edgewater today. I'm out of town on an assignment right now, but you could stop by the university and see what he knows. He's leaving tomorrow, so... Yeah, I got it. Thanks, Marissa. Keep me in the loop, okay? Uh, sure. I hang up and toss the phone back at the end table. It bounces off the side and lands on the ground with a soft thump. Yay. Now back to sleep. Who is that? Oh, hi, Aki. Aki appears in the doorway, looking as energetic as always. I will never understand morning people. Oh, animation! I heard you on the phone. Huh? Oh, Marissa. Let's think about Mr. Alton's old research boss. He's back in town, apparently. She said we should head down to the University of Edgewater to go talk to him. Today. Short deadline. I'll have to make a call. About what? Just getting a few things in place. We'll have to move fast if we want to go today. I like this updated design. Moving fast is not my, is not my idea of a good time. I can still hear the couch calling my name. Aki pauses for a moment and glances down the hallway. Do me a favor? What's up? Wake up, Lee Mei. She points to a door at the end of the hallway. Just knock on her closet door three times. That should do it. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
I sit up with a heavy sigh and stretch. I guess if I have to, if I have to be awake, Lee May should be too. Oh, and do it quietly. She doesn't respond well to surprises. Understandable. Something about Aki's tone sounds like she's not giving me the full story. Big surprise. I shuffle down the hallway, and the thick carpet muffles the sound of my footsteps. Behind me, Aki dials a number on her phone. Aki Mizutani, reporting for duty. Yep, no, we've got a lead on the Otten case. She heads into the kitchen, and the sound of her voice fades. I stand outside Lee May's door for a moment. Aki said to knock on the closet door. Is it really okay to just walk in? I knock softly on the door, but there's no response. Uh, slowly, I turn the knob and push the door open. It swings in with a high-pitched squeak. Uh, uh, Lee May? No response. Across the room, I can see Lee May's sleeping form buried under a pile of blankets. Rap on the closet door three times, quietly. No response. Again, I knock on the door, this time putting more force into it. Yes. Uh, whoa! Lee May's muffled voice sounds from inside the closet. Um, are you? I am awake. Good morning. No, I meant, are you in the closet? Yes. Okay. I object to the reason. Presently. Please wait outside. Right. Sure. I took out of the room, shutting the door behind me. It clicks shut. With another squeal of protest. A sigh, I lean against the wall and blink slowly. I'm still not fully awake, but I'm awake enough to be confused. I can hear Li Bei moving around her room with swift, precise footsteps against the thin carpet. The door swings open again, and she glides into the hallway as smoothly as if she were skating across ice. Good morning, Kongai. Oh, cute. Um, morning. I'm not sure if I, could a I should ask her about the closet thing or not, because it's probably best left unasked for now. Isn't this... I feel like this is a reference to her, like, the concept design from Kansai. Li Mei stares at me curiously for a moment before deciding that it's not worth the effort to ask me anything. I follow her down the hallway to find Aki and Naoki crowded around the computer. It's less time than I'd like, but we'll have to make do. Naoki, my boy. You look more grown up in this design. Also... Always twins. What about Lee May? I don't know if we can get her to pass for a student like us, but we can't leave her here. It's not safe. Hmm. What? What's not safe? Twins spin around to face me, guilty smiles on their faces. Plenty of things. Tornado chasing, splunking, and juggling knives, to name a few. But nothing you have to worry about. Hmm. Should I be concerned about something, you two? Your assurances make me feel safer already. And since when were you students? Aki taps the monitor with her knuckle. An email is displayed on the screen. Lance over it quickly and read out the subject line. You're invited to experience college life with our dorm buddy program. Is this what I think it is? That largely depends on what you think it is, but I'd say you're probably right. Good. We're enrolled in a high school student program. We're going to spend the night at the University of Edgewater. Oh boy. Don't you have to be accepted into the school before they let you wander around and sleep there? Aki flashes her trademark grin at me. Turns out calling the right people can get your name to appear in their database. Who knew? G you, I'm guessing. If we want to talk to Dr. Johansson, it's best not to arouse any suspicions. Therefore, we're going undercover. We'll be able to ask all the questions we want. Including questions about age-old research that we're not supposed to know about? That's not suspicious. We'll figure that part out when we get there. We're scheduled to meet our campus guide in an hour. Which means we have to go now. I mean, in interesting plan. That had a long and mournful sigh. So much for going back to sleep. I guessed as much. I'll get my bag. Grab my backpack from the floor and head to the cramped laundry room at the back of the apartment. Now he was nice enough to add my meager collection of clothes to the group laundry, but he hasn't gotten around to my shirts yet. Guess this one will have to do. 
You snatch a handful of clothing from the pile of neatly folded clothes sitting on top of the dryer. Quick stop at the bathroom for a toothbrush and I'm ready to go. Oh. Back in the main room, I find the twins outfitting each other with glasses. Lee May watches with only the mildest of interest. What, what, what are you wearing? Glasses? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, why? That's not supposed to be a disguise, is it? Of course it is. What do you think? Does it say mild-mannered reporter to you? It says I picked this up at the dollar store. I don't have to wear any, do I? Not if you don't want to. Yeah. But it's more fun this way, don't you think? Uh, I'm not sure if I'd categorize wearing glasses as fun. The most important decision of the game! Sure, why not? It'll be a party. <laughs> Purely cosmetic. I shrug. Excellent! Aki hands me a pair of dark frames and I try them on. Hey! The, the achievement that just pops is purely cosmetic, so maybe this, is, maybe this is purely cosmetic. So? They make you look smart. I'm gonna ignore the implication of that statement. Aki's only response is a teasing smile. So, are you ready to go? Sure. Just please let me sleep in the car. We arrive at the University of Edgewater campus just as the bell in the clock tower strikes ten. Right on time! Oh, hello, chipper guy. You're a pharmacy you're a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical? You're a medical student, aren't you? Overly enthusiastic college boy rushes out to meet us with his arms open wide. He greets Aki and Naoki with hearty handshakes. So glad you all could make it. Glad to be here. It's great to meet Ooh. you. Aki mirrors the guide's posture and smile effortlessly. He beams, pleased to have met a kindred spirit. Smooth. Now he in turn offers a small, shy wave. You must be Haru, and I hope I'm saying this right. Kizaki? Got it in one. Haru and Kizaki? I throw Aki a questioning look. Our real names are off limits in public. Aki responds, using her kansei to speak directly into my mind. Should've figured they wouldn't be allowed to use their real names. Our last adventure together, I learned that they used to make a living as con artists. Back before they started doing whatever you call this. No doubt a search of their names would reveal them to be on a less than savory side of the law. College guide turns to Lee May and to me, and me, to offer the same outpouring of unbridled energy. Lee May calmly sidesteps his outstretched hand, leaving me to bear the brunt of his enthusiasm. Con guy, right? My name is Sean Tassie, and I'm your student liaison. Sean Tassie. Sean pumps my hand vigorously. I try to match his smile the way Aki did, but it doesn't feel right at all. Uh, hey! Uh, nice to meet you! Aki and Naoki both grimace. You're terrible at this. <laughs> I attempt to shoot a glare in her direction without Sean noticing, but it proves to be more difficult than I had hoped. Sean is polite enough to ignore my facial contortions opting instead to fan out a stack of plastic cards. Here are your visitor badges. Hands one to each of us like a doting grandmother measuring out candy to children on Halloween. These will get you into the dorm building where you're staying. There are also three meals encoded onto the magnetic strip. Just swipe them at the cafeteria for a meal. Okay, I've food. Check the card in my hand. It's got my likeness printed on the front along with the name Kangai Alexander. <laughs> That's weird. Aki chose the name Kangai for me because I didn't want to tell her my real name. So how did she know about Alexander? Must the person she called this morning know something? That's your actual last name? Sean interrupts my thoughts with more of his cheerful directions. Now, if you'll follow me this way, I'll take you to the dorm so you can drop your stuff off. Sean takes off at a speed walk across the campus and the rest of us follow as quickly as we can manage. As he walks, Sean points out various landmarks on the campus. Main cafeteria is over that way in the university center. Opens at 7 a.m., closes at midnight. He points down a winding path. Biology lab in that direction. And since you're all listed as potential bio majors, you'll get a tour there later. But you gotta be careful. They say the walls are radioactive. What? W what? Sean laughs at Naoki's reaction. <laughs> no need to worry. I've been taking classes there for four years, and I haven't mutated yet. I'm just severely irradiated, and I'm going to die in two weeks. Yes, because that's comforting. Sean halts suddenly and spins around. Almost forgot. 
Our illustrious bell tower is there. He points at the tall structure looming over the campus. The bell tower is the only building still part of the original campus. Originally, it was meant as a warning signal in case of flood. That's where the final boss is going to be. These days, it just tells the time. That's it's good. It's all automated now. But back in the day, freshmen were required to ring it every hour. If you didn't show up for your shift, you wouldn't graduate. That's kind of fucked up. Turns on his heel and marches down a cobblestone pathway that leads away from the tower. Makes you guys the lucky ones. I had a 4 a.m. shift on the same day as an 8 a.m. class. It was killer. Wait, it was that recent of a policy? Uh, anyway, what the fuck? here we are. He throws his arms open wide and proudly presents to us a big building that looks like it's seen better days. Jeez, that, that literally means it's like two or three. That, when he said that, it was a thing that felt like it was like a 30 years ago kind of thing. But that's... If he's just fucking doing it, it's uh... Me so much off guard I couldn't even finish my sentence. Sean points at the card reader by the entrance. All you have to do to get in is wave your card over the reader. Go ahead and give it a go. Aki steps up and places her card against the tiny black box. It beeps cheerfully and the lock clicks open. Sean holds the door open for us and we all trek inside. The first floor is, floor is fairly empty. I guess everyone is in class right now. Okay. Kazaki and Kangai will be in room 103 in the first hallway. The girls' hall is over this way. Oh, okay. Your dorm buddy isn't in right now, so I'll get you two set up. Dorm buddy? Motions for Aki and Lee Mei to follow him, and the three disappear down the hallway. Aoki and I stare at each other for a moment. How did we get here, bro? So, just go in then? I think so. Are uh, your missions always this vague? I slide my keycard into the card reader mounted on room 103's door. Honestly, I'm not sure what we're even... What? A bright flash of light blinds us as soon as the door swings open. <laughs> now he flinches and takes a step back. Click, click. Oh. Uh, hi. As my pupils readjust themselves to the light, I finally make the out... Make... Make out the outline of a guy holding a camera. Um, hi. We're here for the high school student something or other? The guy taps his camera and snaps another picture of us. Can can you not? Uh-huh. I know. You can come in. Now can I enter hesitantly? So, which one is which? I'm Kanga. Kizaki. Kuku, Aaron, welcome to the command central of awesome. What? Well, that's... there's a new one. I assume that's not the official name? No. It's the cool name. He points to a couple of sleeping bags rolled up in the corner of the room. Uh, those are for you. You can unpack before we go to the lab. Now he and I kneel beside the sleeping bags and unpack our few belongings. Aaron hovers around us the entire time, snapping pictures at random. Um, is there any reason you're taking all these pictures? Aaron inspects his camera for a brief moment, as if he didn't even notice he was holding it. Cause... I like it? Fair enough. Okay. Understandable. Now he looks like he wants to say something else, but he remains silent. I should ask Aaron to stop. Eh, let's not rock the bow. Right now. Is it like your hobby or something? Sort of. He lets go of his camera and it swings on the strap around his neck. I just started doing it one day in high school, and it was fun, so I kept doing it. You can make a career out of that. Well, that's all our stuff unpacked. What's next? Did Sean already show you around the campus? Um, a little bit. He pointed out all the buildings when we came here. Well, I can answer any other questions you might have. He opens the door for us, and we file out. What about Haru and Lee Mei? 
Now he uses Aki's false name without hesitation. I wonder how often they use these identities. Ah, uh, Sean probably already took them. We'll meet them again at the bio building. Okay. Okay then. Aoki sighs. He really doesn't look happy to be away from Aki. Aaron leads us down the path and through the University of Edgewater's campus. Ah, a fountain. He stops frequently to point out various buildings, tell us about student traditions, or share stories about the university's founders. Are you a student here? I guess dorm buddy is a student who's sharing his dorm room with us? That would make sense. That feels like it could go horribly wrong unless you have a... S Some of it is a rehash of Sean's tour, but most of it is new information. It's hard for me to keep up, but Naoki seems to be taking it all in without any problem. His Kansei of perfect memory seems awfully convenient right about now. I don't see many people around here. Holiday? This isn't the main campus. The original school was built here, but the university expanded. Most of the other buildings are at the main campus about a mile away. Uh, uh... He snapped another shot of us with his camera, but I don't think he even notices he's doing it. Oh, they don't post many pictures of the main campus. The bell tower is all historic and junk, so they use it on all the newsletters. Wait, makes sense. As our tour draws to a close, Aaron leads us to a tall building painted with glass. And a fountain. Time for science! Oh, that uh, actually looks pretty cool. What is this place? Grad student lab. Dr. Hansen's team works here. Oh shit, oh yeah, here we go. Okay, Brosev. Now can I trade glances? This could be our chance to talk to Dr. Johansson. Aaron waves his card over the small card reader at the building entrance and we file in after him. Aki and Lee May are waiting inside. Yay! Oh, you're early. Aaron snaps a few pictures of the girls in quick, su quick succession. Yeah, and Sean said he had somewhere to be, so he dropped us off here. Cool, cool. Then you're with me now. Let's get going. As Aaron leads us to the building, Aki slows her pace until we're walking side by side. Split off from us and look for Dr. Johansson. I frown at her. Considering Otten's interest in you, he might be more willing to talk to you than a stranger. Fair enough. Or he might be even less willing to talk to me. Also fair. Don't really or know. Or he might be even less willing to talk to you. Just read my mind, why don't you, girl? I just... What up? Oh, nothing. Just thinking aloud how, about how cool this is. Or, sorry, proper phrasing. Just, oh, nothing. Just thinking out loud about how cool this is. He grins and snaps a photo of me. I don't think he's even aware he did it. It is pretty cool, isn't it? Don't, don't ever say that again, bro. Aaron returns to his tour, unfazed by my outburst, and Akira returns to my side. I know it's risky going alone, but it's our best bet. Now go. I'll make sure Aaron ignores you for as long as possible. I nod once and duck into a side hallway as soon as Aaron turns around. The glowing fluorescent lights reflect off of the polished white tile floor, giving the entire place a sterile, washed-out look. I scan the hallway, searching for any hint of where Dr. Johansson might be. This place looks familiar, but I'm not sure why. I didn't see this in a... I hope we didn't see this in a horror movie somewhere. If that's the case, I'm probably the first to go. That's what I get for separating the rest of the, from the rest of the group. I stroll down a horror hallway, trying hard not to look like a potential victim. What exactly am I worried about, anyway? So far, I don't see any signs labeled this way to secret evil genetic, genetic experiments. Didn't we see a white hallway... In the surveillance video we found in Otten's vault. Door in front of me swings open with all this and with all the skill and grace of a trained athlete, I plant my face right into it. Ah! Watch your step. We don't want another Oh hello. Oh gosh. Woon's expression changes slowly as recognition dawns on her face. Which is weird because I've never seen her before. You Me? <laughs> she turns on her heel and yells down the hallway. Nathan! David! He's back! Two more doors fly open, and a couple of guys around the same age as the woman come rushing out. Whoa! You've got a lightsaber on your back. One of them is wearing a shirt that says, Real Football! He either has some sort of light sword strapped to his back. I think it's from the War Stars movies. 
Oh, that's a football. Both of them look panicked. It's him! Oh no, real football, oh, that's his name. Um, yeah, I think we covered that part already. I can't believe the thief actually returned. The what? Uh-oh, this can't end well. Real football reaches me first. He reaches down and grabs me by the arm. Got him! Well, that sounds ominous. Real football pulls at my arm and I grudgingly stand. Good job, David. Take him to the lab upstairs. Oh no. The lab? Guess I'm an horror film after all. I'd not be killed in a creepy school lab, though. Yeah. Hang on, I think I got the right guy. I think I got the wrong guy here. No, I'm pretty sure you're the guy. Or did you think we wouldn't notice that someone broke in and stole our research? Real football. David, apparently, tightens his grip on my arm. It's more constricting than I'd like. I think he works out. He gets regular exercise, at least. More than me. I... wait, what? No, you definitely have the wrong guy. That remains to be seen. David gives me a tug and I follow. It'll be easier to explain I'm innocent if I don't run. I just hope Aki's nearby. I could really use a bailout. David, Nathan, take him in. David escorts me down the hallway with the other two following close behind. What is going on here? War stars? Nathan, I guess, brandishes his light sword at me, as if it's a useful weapon of some sort. <laughs> At the end of the hall, David ushers me into a small, sparsely furnished room. What is going on here? David guides me to one of the overstuffed chairs. It's not nearly as comfortable as it looks. It's, there's a large mirror set in the wall on the opposite side of the room. Clearly, it's one of those one-way mirrors that they use in lab testing. Am I in some sort of study room? So, uh, hey? Don't talk. We're not going to consort with the likes of you. G-consort? Nathan raises a haughty eyebrow, but he doesn't deign to respond. Right, okay, no consorting. You guys want to at least tell me why I'm here? You're the guy who broke in. Yes, I caught that part. Do you really think that? David shrugs. He almost looked bored. Oh no, it was, uh... I wish I remembered his name, but it's... It's gotta be the nephew from... Shit. Oh. I only saw the tape once. There's other stuff on my mind these days. Hey, we're not supposed to consort. I'm not consorting. Dude just wants to know why he's here. Nathan points his light sword at me. What if he's from Western? They've been trying to get their hands on our research for years. I don't know, man. He doesn't look smart enough to be Western. What? Even with the glasses? I'm hurt. The door swings open cutting off any response that David might offer me. The young woman enters, carrying a slim, brown folder. She sits across from me at the table, and nods at David and Nathan. They leave without a word. Well, I guess there's no question who's in charge here. Are you comfortable? Not particularly, but I'm going out on a limb here and guessing that's kind of the point. A thin smile appears on her face. We use this room for sleep studies, mostly. It's supposed to be neutral. Oh, well, it's very neutral. Good job. Or mediocre job, I guess? Her expression tightens. I'm afraid we're still strangers. My name is Jupiter. Jupiter, oh. Kong guy. Unusual, but I suppose I'm not one to talk. It's okay, you can laugh. Why? I'm not gonna laugh. She pauses for a brief moment to search my expression. Do you know why you're here? That's a pretty deep question. Why is anyone here? Does humankind even have a purpose? Kong guy, not the time. She stares at me without remark. I can't tell if she's amused or annoyed. The campus may be a public university, but this lab is off-limits to anyone without clearance. I'd like to know how you came to be wandering around alone in our hallway. I'm here with a tour group. The, um, high school welcoming program or something. A tour group of one? With no guide? I sort of lost, lost them, but hey, if you let me go, I can go look for them. Jupiter doesn't respond. I can't read her expressions at all. Last Monday, someone broke into this lab and stole some very important research. That's, um, too bad? It is too bad. Thankfully for us, we caught him on film. He pulls a printout from the slim folder and slides it across the table towards me. But when I see it, my heart sinks. No wonder this place looked familiar. 
On the table sits a grainy image I've seen before. The last time I saw it, we were digging through Mr. Alton's secret files after he died. He had a video file of me walking down a hallway, but I don't remember ever being in such a place. At the time, we assumed it was old footage from before I came to Edgewater. I didn't know why he had it, but he didn't seem too relevant. Apparently, it was. Oh, so it wasn't his nephew then. I look up to see Jupiter studying my face. So you recognize it? Well, yeah, he looks like me. She shakes her head. I mean, you've seen this exact image before. Where? Can't exactly tell her I stole from Mr. Alton's house after his death, can I? Let's be... We gotta give her something in order to get her off her back. It was in Mr. Alton's files. I went to his house for something. Something. He sounds incredulous. I can't really blame her. William Alton, may he rest in peace, doesn't just invite people over to his place for a cup of coffee. Well, I wasn't there for coffee. She leans in and lowers her voice. And what were you there for? Uh-oh. That's classified. I try not to sound too smug, but it feels kind of nice not to be on the receiving end of the classified runaround for once. Jupiter presses on, undeterred. Who are you? That's also classified, but I can tell you who I'm not. I tap the photo on the table with my hand. I'm not him. I don't have time for this. She isn't buying a word of what I'm saying. How's this? I won't press charges if you tell me who hired you to steal that. Was it Western State? Who? It's a soft wrapping on the glass. Some sort of signal, I suppose. Maybe you're telling the truth, maybe you're not. She slides back into her chair and stands. But we'll leave that for the police to sort out. Oh boy. The, the police? The door swings open with a slow creak. You have got to be kidding. Well, this is the least surprising call I've gotten all day. Hi, Detective. I sigh and hang my head. It wasn't me, officer. Words sound so recited by now. Right, it never is. Detective Gursky rubs the side of his head as if he's already got a headache. He steps closer to me and lowers his voice. Where are the others? Aki's not supposed to let you out of her sight. She's the one who told me to split off with the group. Eh, sorry. Never mind. He pulls out a phone and taps the screen a few times. All on campus, at least. That's good. Trackers? Are you tracking them? It's part of the job description. Fair enough. Are you tracking me? Are you sure you want to know? On second thought? No, I don't. Not really. Detective Gursky taps on the screen a few more times before pocketing his phone. Alright. What's this all about? She says I broke into this lab. Officer, we have video evidence of his entry. Breaking in, huh? He frowns at me. Did he take anything? He did. He copied some research for a project we're working on. It's... She glances at the mirror. It's important. And when did this break-in take place? Last week, Monday night, 10.52. We found out about it on Tuesday morning. Gursky turns to me. Where were you at that time? That time I was on a bus heading towards Edgewater. I wasn't even in the city at the time. But I lied about my name when I got the ticket. There'd be no proof it was me on that bus. Oh, well, this got awkward. Um, I was... Oh boy. Door bursts open and a girl with platinum blonde hair and white eyes pokes her head into the room. He was with me! <gasps> Hi, Chance! Chance? Doorway stands Chance Jackson, part-time barista and full-time aspiring singer. We first met at a coffee shop last week. That's when I tripped over the dead body that got me tangled up with all this craziness. I didn't expect to see her again, and I certainly didn't expect her to lie to cover for me. Miss Jackson? Detective Gursky is just as surprised as I am. Officer, hello again. Chance gives Gursky a small wave. I was just coming by to drop off lunch for my boyfriend and I heard they caught a thief. But you've got it all wrong.
wrong. It's not him at all. She looks at me, and her eyes begin to well up with tears. Don't arrest poor Kongai. How'd you know my name? Poor Kongai? He glances questioningly, questioningly at me out of the corner of my eye. His eye. I shrug. He was at the coffee shop with me last week. We are open late, and he was there the whole time. Hmm. Is that true? This might be the only alibi, but I don't know if I should lie any more than I already have. I don't know. Comment now in the comment section. Give me the old Phoenix right. Tell the truth. Or the old Phoenix right. Lie like a dog. This is certainly taking a turn. Taking a turn. Until next time. Until then. Thanks for watching.